Hello, and welcome back to CS615 System Administration. Since we'll be using Git for a number of our assignments and projects, and since it's commonly accepted that nobody really knows how Git works, I thought it might be useful to do a quick run through how to set up Git for our class. And by Git, I mean Git, not GitHub. No, seriously, it's possible to use Git without GitHub. I know, right? Git is a distributed version control system. GitHub is a company owned by Microsoft that basically provides Git as a service. Now obviously, GitHub is hugely popular, both as a hosted platform for proprietary software development, as well as a public platform for open source development, and many of the workflows enabled and promoted by GitHub are indeed quite useful. But at the end of the day, the core functionality is available for you via Git, the tool developed by none other than Linus Torvalds. In this short video, we're not going to get into the details of how Git works. As I said, I don't think anybody really knows. And of course you're encouraged to read up on your own on the common Git workflows, but I do want to quickly show you how to get set up for this class to ensure you hit the ground running. Since we're going to be using the Linux lab systems here at Stevens, we'll start by setting up our SSH config for this first. And as you know, when you connect to a host for the first time, you'll be asked whether you can confirm the authenticity of the host key. And virtually every single person on the internet doesn't even blink once and says, oh sure, when they actually mean, how the hell would I know? Go away, let me log in. But we'd like to find a better way and actually know that we're connecting to the host we think we're connecting to. There are some ways to solve this chicken egg, such as using DNS SSH FP records, we'll mention those again in a future class, or to use SSH certificates instead of host keys. The simplest way, though, is for you to retrieve the host fingerprint to put into your non-host file via some other means. I thought Stevens IT had put the SSH host key fingerprint somewhere, but since I couldn't find it, I put the relevant key on the course website. The Linux lab name actually points to a load balance rotation of hosts, each reachable via the same IP address. It used to be a DNS round robin, which made this a little bit less convenient, so now we only need a single line that we need to append to a known hosts file, which we can do like this. Okay, so next, as system administrators, we're quite lazy and hate to type more than absolutely necessary, and typing sshlinuxlab.cs.stevenstech.edu is a bit annoying, so we're going to add a little snippet to our ssh config to let us just type ssh stevens instead. So here you can add other short names if you like. We're gonna use just stevens. We enable strict host key checking since we have the correct known hosts entry. My username at Stevens is different from the local username on my laptop, so I'll also specify that here. Next, I provide the path to the correct SSH key to connect to Stevens. Specify that we only want to forward the correct identities and silence some debugging information. You can look at the SSH config manual page for more information about the various options available. Okay, these options now in place, we can now simply type SSH Stevens to log in on the remote system. There we are. Now we can go ahead and configure Git on these systems. Let's start by setting our email address. As well as the default push model. Now we create our raw git repository. For that we need a new directory that will contain all the git metadata. Once we create the directory, we can then initialize the directory via git init bare. Now, and this is important, this will not be the directory where we create files or work from. Instead, this will be where git stores all its information. So now, 
we change out of this directory and clone the repository we just created. You may be used to cloning directories using either an HTTPS or an SSH prefix to specify a remote repository in another system, perhaps GitHub. But a remote repository can also be specified as a directory on the local system, which is what we're doing here. Alright, we appear to have cloned an empty repository. Well, that's not surprising. So let's add a readme. This repository will contain all coursework for the class CS615 System Administration. Next, we git add the file and commit it. Now, if we want to make changes, we follow the normal git flow. We edit the file, We create a new subdirectory. And we create our first nodes for week one. And again, git add and git commit. And then git push our changes to the upstream repository. As you see, this all behaves just like any other git repository, even though it's in a local directory. But the nice thing is that with that repository initialized on Linux Lab, we can now also use that as a remote repository from our laptop. For that, we simply clone it by specifying the hostname, and Git will, with the help of our SSH config, sort things out for us. Let's give that a try. Notice that here we're specifying the raw Git repository to clone on the remote side. We can now edit files in our local copy. Say, add a sentence about our glorious git success to our week one notes. We git commit our changes. And then push them back upstream. If we're back in the next lab, we simply change into the check that repository and issue a git pull. Git log shows all commit history as we'd expect and all changes are now present here. And we're done. We've set up git for use with this class and all without using GitHub at all. Hooray! Please make sure that you follow the setup and begin using Git for your course notes as well as your homework assignments going forward. The links here in the slides should help you further if you're not familiar with Git already. If you run into problems, please reach out on the class mailing list or Slack. Until next time, thanks for watching. Cheers!